is how economic economists perceive a property. Now, this isn't just how economists perceive a property. Um, many leftists perceive a property this way. I'm sure capitalists perceive a property this way. But I'm using the title how economists perceive a property just as a general coverall for all the different types of people who perceive property in this very niche way under capitalism that I am going to explain to you now. So capital is a funny term in economics because it has two meanings. The first meaning is a four branch tree which defines all of the, um, all of the uh, property in a system, okay? And capital also means money, so like liquid capital, for example, just means money or currency. So the four, the, the four pillars of the capital tree are as follows, okay? Entrepreneurship, I'm gonna explain each of these after I do um, my counting off, so just hang tight. So entrepreneurship, land, capital, and labor or human capital, okay? So let's start with the first one, entrepreneurship. So what is entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial capital? So entrepreneurial capital is essentially the idea for something. Now it doesn't have to be a new something, it just has to be idea for the idea for something, but the founding idea. So if you are a bakery, then your founding idea is either your chief recipe or a family cookbook or just ideas in your head about how a patisserie could be run better, right? You essentially have an idea for a business or for a, a co-op or however you want to run your establishment. The individual who has the idea or, or the individuals, individual or individuals who have the idea or ideas, they have the entrepreneurial capital. They are what gets the business driver moving, okay? Now, once you have an entrepreneurial idea, you need the other three types of capital, okay? So the next type of capital we talk about is land. And I don't mean like, like farms, um, although farms are a type of land capital. I mean any type of land capital. You could have an office space in a huge building. Um, you could have a food cart. You could have uh, an area of the sidewalk where you play music for money, right? Land capital could be a lot of different things. But essentially, at the end of the day, land capital is the space, the physical space, in which you do the thing that you have come up with in your entrepreneurial capital prong of this four capital tree, okay? After that, we have capital, which in this sense means money or currency. So a lot of times this means either seed currency, or seed money from an investor or multiple investors, money that you've saved up, or, or some other type of investment that you have in order to get your business going. The, the old saying, you have to spend money to make money, in some ways is true about businesses in the cap, in the businesses in the capitalist sphere, or you have to borrow money to make money, or whatever, whatever you want to say, right? But that third branch of the tree, capital, it provides the it, it provides you the ability to buy other things. So capital in this case also includes assets. So capital generally means money, but it can also mean assets. So those can be liquid assets like money. Those can be non-liquid assets like, so let's go back to our, our patisserie example earlier, right? So if you have, if our entrepreneur, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's say it's a, a, you know, a group of chefs, they decide that they want to open a patisserie, right? They have ideas for what makes a great patisserie and what types of baked goods that they could make that are going to woo the public, right? They are going to need land, whether that is a storefront or a little, or a food cart or a food truck or um, their own homes or whatever. They, they need some kind of land capital. They need some place to do the business that they want to do. Next, they need capital. They need assets of some kind. So that's going to be like an industrial kitchen. So ovens, fans, um, <clears throat> washing stations, sanitizing stations, chopping stations, food storage, refrigerators, freezers, pantries, right? All these things go into, and, and they're things that can be bought and sold, right? They're, they're non-perishables, um, as it were. And of course, you have to fill those. You have to use your leftover liquid capital to buy the things you need to actually run the business. 
flour, egg, sugar, butter. Um, God, I made myself hungry. Um, with this guy, I should have picked a different example, a less hungry example, but that, that aside. So they need to use their liquid capital to buy all the other things that they need. And then there's the last bit of capital that our uh, patissiers need, which is human capital or labor capital. And that's us, you and me, regular workers. The reason that we fall under the category of capital is because it costs money to employ us. Now, I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the idea that when um, costs are high and capital needs to be cut, the first capital that goes is human capital, right? Oftentimes, and for many businesses, the highest recurring cost is labor, right? So it's the easiest one to cut. It's harder to sell an oven in a patisserie because you need it to make your products. It's easier to fire someone, just have someone else work a longer shift or what have you, right? So anyway, that goes to human capital, which, uh, which as I said, is workers. But they don't have to be employees. Human capital can be any type of um, relationship where there is pay exchange in, in exchange for work. It can be independent contractors. It can be, um, you know, people who are on revolving schedules or, or work for large organizations and just pass through and, and things like that. There are lots of ways that human capital can be organized. But at the end of the day, it is the fourth branch of our capital tree, which is human capital. So I'm going to cap up this segment by talking up, by talking all the way through our patisserie example. And then hopefully finding a pastry that I can shove in my face. Um, <laughs> probably not though. So our first example, we have our group of chefs. They have an idea. This is their entrepreneurial capital. They use this entrepreneurial capital to maybe pitch an idea, get some investors, or they use their savings, uh, which is our capital, our money capital, our liquid capital, to start the business. In order, in order to do that, they also need a place to do business, land capital. They put up a storefront somewhere. That's their land capital. They then fill this storefront with ovens and refrigerators and knife blocks and cutting boards and pantries and offices and tables and chairs and glasses and drink machines and all this. These are all assets, right? And then the last thing, before they can finally open, they need people who will wait the tables, clean the tables, clean the windows, make the, uh, make the pastries, sell the pastries, work the register, things like that. That is the human capital. So with these four capitals combined, we are able to open our lovely patisserie and hopefully the business takes off. Great, all sounds good. There is, and so now that I've explained kind of how this property is perceived, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens in businesses with this, right? So one of the major issues with the way this is perceived of, is that there is no inherent balancing act required between the different costs and benefits of human capital, labor capital, so human capital, labor capital, land capital, asset capital, and entrepreneurial capital, right? No one says you have to pay your work, pay your workers more than you pay for your assets, or more than you pay for your rent, or more than you pay for your ideas. And and, and you can you can you know, you can use that rule with any of the four items. I'm not going to go through all 16 combinations, but you get the general idea, right? There is no one capital that inherently dominates over the other ones. As we have moved forward in this capitalist experiment that we have been under, what tends to happen is that organizations reward entrepreneurial capital or the leadership of an organization much more than they're willing to reward the um, the workers of an organization or in land or anything else. So CEO pays go up, worker pay stays the same, work goes up very slowly, or God forbid goes down. Land oftentimes is wholly owned by the company or a company that it owns. So oftentimes for a lot of it, the only cost you're paying is property tax. And that in the grand scheme of things is very low. Asset capital for many organizations, assets don't cost them a ton of money to maintain. So the amount of money that goes there is typically um, fairly low, very low or non-existent. Oftentimes an asset can last for a very long time. So once you purchase it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and of course you can always repair it. It costs a little bit more money, but again, not really, um, you know, not really the end of the world there. So what happens when hu the human capital that you have is producing lots of liquid capital for the organization. 
that capital can either be given out to shareholders and public companies, or it can be re reinvested in private companies. Either way, that money has to go somewhere, in theory. Now, as a socialist, I personally think the best place to put that money is in the pockets of your workers. But, uh, and to improve the quality of your human capital by paying them more. And, and I, by the way, I'm using human capital. I'm not meaning to dehumanize workers. I myself am a worker. So I'm just giving this in the, the flattest, most economic terms that I can give it in and not be, you know, and not try and create personas for this, uh, for these laborers or for these people. But there are workers, I respect them. I think they should be doing better. Okay, so just that aside. So what happens when the labor capital is making, is helping the business a lot more than the other types of capital are, like entrepreneurial capital, for example. Oftentimes what ends up happening, partially because of greed, but partially because that's how the system is incentivized, is that the people with the ideas, who had the ideas at first, who may no longer be part of the workforce or may only be supervisory in nature, take the fat wealth, take the liquid capital, and they reinvest it in themselves. They raise their wages, they open new stores, they hire more people, but at lower cost, uh, but um, at lower wages than they could than if they just reinvested that capital in their human capital, right? reinvested that, that liquid capital in their human capital. So the system that incentivizes this different distribution of capital is actually the enemy of socialists and leftists. It's not actually the breakup of these, it's not actually the breakup of capital into the four sub branches of capital, um, you know, labor, entrepreneurial, land, and, and you know, money. That will, that set of capital will likely exist no matter what economic system we exist under. It might be called something else other than capital, but you know, you get the general idea. These four branches of how enterprise works will likely persist past capitalism, past social democracy, maybe even past socialism. But regardless of what economic system you have in place, you are very likely to have these four different types of capital. The economic system that we have, capitalism, communism, socialism, whatever, essentially determines what share of the excess of these four branches should be reinvested where. In capitalism, you give to your shareholders because we've passed laws and, and made corporations responsible for making their shareholders as wealthy as possible in exchange for their investment, whatever that investment happens to be. In a socialist system, uh, that excess capital goes to the workers who in some cases may be, may also own the entrepreneurial capital, but in some cases may just, you know, the entrepreneurial capital may be paid what it's due and then severed, or they're just treated as another part of human capital. And although they may be rewarded more for their contribution, they're not rewarded unfairly more or so much more uh, than the regular, than, than, you know, everyone else who participates as human capital. So anyway, this kind of got uh, got away from me a little bit, but I've been meaning to talk about this for a long time. This is a great little lesson in economics. If you have any questions about any of this, obviously leave a comment uh, on Facebook or YouTube. I am more than happy to discuss this. Uh, I really enjoy talking about this stuff, and it's really helpful for us to understand how these economic systems work in order for us to overthrow them. And I'm gonna end with a kind of a funny story. So I have been uh, a leftist for a very long time, and in high school, I did not want to take economics because it was going to be inherently a capitalistic course and it was probably going to be gross and, and all this other stuff. It turned out not to be, but the thing that made me take it was someone who I knew who wanted to encourage me to take economics and said, hey, you can't know how to beat them if you don't know what they're doing. If you don't understand the way the system works, you can't take it down. And that has been a great piece of advice that I have been happy to roll with um, essentially my entire life. So I encourage you to keep learning with me uh, and to keep getting educated with me. Uh, and we will, we will find the ways to tackle these systems because we will learn how these systems work and undermine them.